the today's topic is minoxidil in hair loss. So it's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Devakar is a distinguished consultant dermatologist with a vast amount of experience and expertise in his field. He graduated from the University of Madras in 1993 and earned his MD degree in 1996. He then completed his MRCP and CST in dermatology in the UK after finishing the Masseri rotation. In 2009, his alma mater, the University of Madras, conferred him the title of honorary professor. Mr. Yashudan has an interest in extensive interest in oral manifestation of dermatology, topical skin diseases, pediatric dermatology, and dermatological surgery. He has published more than 150 peer review journals and co-authored chapter in two textbooks. So Dr. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words of introduction. Um, I'd first like to thank all the organizers, particularly Dr. John Jacob, uh, Dr. Sri Kumar, Dr. SMS Pillai, Dr. Shinod. Thank you so much. I know I've done this uh, talk virtually, but this is the first time I'm experiencing the warmth of your hospitality. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my topic today is oral minoxidil for hair loss. And I think hair loss, you'll all agree is a distressing symptom. It's distressing for the patient and until now it has been distressing, distressing for the doctors as well because we didn't have much to offer by way of management. But I think this medication, oral minoxidil, may well be a game changer. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is give you a rough idea of the history of how it came to be used, um, how it works, uh, the indications and some practicalities, what the dosages and what the potential side effects are. So it's interesting to see how oral minoxidil first came uh, to be used. Um, if you look at it, it's actually the molecule was synthesized by a pharmaceutical company called Upjohn. And in the 1960s and 70s, it first was synthesized to treat acid peptic disease. That was the main indication for it. And then they found that when they were using it for acid peptic disease, it had a sustained redu reduction in blood pressure. And at that time in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge hypertension crisis. Um, therefore, the FDA approved it for hypertension, but they said that you can use it only for two weeks. But it was so effective that doctors started using it for longer and longer. And when they used it for longer, they found that it caused a potential side effect, which was hypertrichosis and increased hair. And that's when it came to be used for hair loss. Upjohn first didn't actually want to publicize it. They kept it very secret. But this article in the New England Journal of Medicine changed all that. Once people knew that it could reverse hair loss, everybody wanted part of the action. Upjohn was later acquired by Pfizer and they are the ones who first promoted the use of minoxidil. So in the 1980s, it was first used as a topical solution. It came up as a 2% topical solution. And the use of oral minoxidil is much more recent. In fact, the first uh, case report came only in 2014. And only in the last five to six years have, been, have there been some case series. There are still very few randomized controlled trials. Most of them are case series. And all the uses of oral minoxidil for hair conditions are what we call off-label, which means there's no randomized control trials for it. So why do we need to use oral minoxidil? Firstly, it is more convenient. In a, when you use topical minoxidil, it is not always possible to use it on all the areas. It's operator dependent. We may miss some of the areas where we have to use it. It also avoids some of the side effects. When we use topical minoxidil, you can get an allergic or an irritant contact dermatitis, and you don't get that with oral minoxidil. And finally, it may be more efficacious. Um, I mean, there are some studies, just one study actually, which compares 5% minoxidil and oral minoxidil, and they found that it was more or less the same with probably an edge for oral minoxidil. So generally speaking, the oral agent seems to be better than the topical agent. So we should first, define what oral 
or what low dose oral minoxidil is. When it was used for hypertension, the dose was quite high. It started at 10 milligrams and went up to 40 milligrams. So that's the prescription dose for hypertension. The International Society of Hypertension says that the dose where it starts causing a reduction in the blood pressure is somewhere between 5 and 10 milligrams. So if you look at the dermatological literature for hair loss, all the studies were less than 5 milligrams. In fact, some of them were very small. It starts only at 0.25 milligrams. So that's the dosage that we are looking at, 0.25 to 5 milligrams a day for oral minoxidil for hair loss conditions. Let's look at two factors. What does it do to the hair diameter and what does it do to the hair density? Firstly, the hair diameter. What it does is for every one milligram that you increase the dose of oral minoxidil, the hair diameter increases by 1.4 micrometers. And this was a study which showed it. You can see that after 24 weeks of treatment, there seems to be much thicker hair and that's because of an increase in their hair diameter. It also increases the hair density, so every uh, increase in the milligram of minoxidil increases the amount of terminal hairs and total hair density as well. So what the total hair density is actually not that important because it includes vellus hair which is not visible, but the terminal hair density is important. And if you look at it, for every one milligram, there's an increase of at least nine terminal hairs per centimeter square. And that's what you're seeing as the increased density and thickness of the hair clinically. This study clearly shows that there's an increase in the hair density. If you look at the pictures, all the ones in green numbered below are new hairs. And this came after four months of treatment of 2.5 milligrams a day. What's the possible mechanisms? There are quite a few mechanisms which are postulated. The first thing is it's a vasodilator. That's how it works in hypertension. So if there's vasodilation, there's more nutrients, more blood flow going to the hair follicles, and therefore it possibly increases the, the strength of the hair. It also seems to prolong the anagen phase. We all know that the hair goes through these three cycles, you know, anagen, catagen, telogen, and if you prolong the anagen phase, naturally you get thicker hairs and more hair density as well. It also seems to have an inhibitory effect on androgens. This again seems to be at the level of the hair follicle itself. And finally, there seems to be immunomodulate reactions. There are some studies which show that the number of T lymphocytes are reduced at the level of the hair follicle. And this may be the reason why it works on some immunological hair loss as well, which I will be telling you briefly. One thing to note is that it takes time. So if you start oral minoxidil, the minimum period we have to wait really is at least two to four months. In fact, Many authors actually suggest that we stick to one dose for between four to six months to have the full effect of the treatment. So let's look at a few specific hair diseases in which it has been used. Probably the commonest condition we see in our clinics is female pattern hair thinning. And the biggest paper was by Rodrigues Bazara who had 148 patients and they found that in their series, about one milligram per day was the treatment which they used. They also found that if the hair loss was more advanced, there seemed to be more thickening of the hair. So the more advanced the hair loss, the more the reason why we have to offer oral minoxidil for our patients. Professor Sinclair also used to combine this with spironolactone, which is an anti-androgen. In fact, he used very low doses for combination with spironolactone, he used 0.25 milligrams of minoxidil and 25 milligrams of spironolactone. And that's actually quite a useful combination because minoxidil can sometimes cause fluid retention and spironolactone gets rid of it. So it's a very useful combination and the anti-androgen effect of spironolactone may be beneficial as well. So it's a very good combination which we could consider. For male androgenetic alopecia, the, hair, the dose is slightly higher. So you probably start somewhere at 2.5 milligrams and then you increase the dose. This was the Thai study which showed that there was 100% benefit, which means there was some improvement in hair loss, hair, hair growth, but 43% had a very significant response. This was a series of 70 patients from Thailand. Again, they noticed that the longer you use it, the better it was. So 
all the more reason that we don't give up very early, give it for at least three to six months. They found that the hair thickening was everywhere, but it was probably better in the vertex than in the frontal scalp. You may think that an immunological condition like alopecia areata may not be that, it may not be that useful, but this was a very interesting paper, again from Professor Sinclair. Uh, this was a series of 24 patients, it's not 16, it's 24, and they used a dose of 0.25 to 2.5 milligrams a day. So what they did was, they used the usual alopecia areata treatment, either interlesional steroids or oral steroids, but they added in minoxidil, and then after they stopped the steroids, they continued with the minoxidil. Now, we know that alopecia areata is an immunological condition, so there is a chance of relapse. What the authors then did was looked at the relapse rate in those who had oral minoxidil. And if those who had oral minoxidil, you can see that the recurrence came down from an estimated 54% to just 17%. So only four patients uh, uh, had a relapse of the alopecia areata, and of these, three were mild. Only one was moderate in severity. Chronic telogen effluvium is another common indication, and this was, again, a series of 36 patients by Professor Sinclair. He used low doses. Professor Sinclair from Australia seems to use lower doses in combination with other drugs. Uh, one other point he also noted was if you use minoxidil with other agents, whether you use it as monotherapy or as combination treatment, the response is just as good. So it suggests that actually it's minoxidil working on its own rather than in combination with other drugs. So in this series, he found that if you use it for a period of at least six months, the hair shedding decreased by 86%, which was a significant number. It can be used for quite a lot of other non-scarring alopecias as well. So loose antigen hair syndrome, monolithics, chemotherapy-induced alopecia, and traction alopecia. So we don't have to restrict ourselves to specific conditions and that's the beauty of old minoxidil. You can use it for almost any hair loss condition. And interestingly, it can work for scarring alopecia as well. So there are series which shows that it works for lichen, uh, plano pilaris, central, centrifugal, cicatricial alopecia, and even frontal fibrosing alopecia. What it may be doing in these conditions is, we, we already mentioned that it may have an immunomodulatory action, but what is probably more practical is that it thickens the existing hairs so when the existing hairs are thicker, it sort of masks, masks the amount of scarring alopecia. So that's possibly the way it works. I'm just going to pick up lichen plano pilaris alone because that's probably the commonest scarring alopecia we see in our practice. It seems to be effective whether it's localized or generalized lichen plano pilaris. And as I mentioned, it seems to have a thickening effect of the unaffected hairs and therefore it seems to mask the area of alopecia. You can use it with other anti-inflammatory agents. So the commonest agent we use usually is hydroxychloroquine. So in combination with that, it seems to have a good effectiveness in thickening of the hair. And this was a case uh, report which came in the American Academy of Dermatology looking at lichen plano pilaris. And you can clearly see that there was improvement after the addition of minoxidil, oral minoxidil for four months. This patient was also on hydroxychloroquine and had also had intralesional triamcinolone. So it's a combination of things which worked for this person. What are the adverse effects that we need to be aware of? Most of the adverse effects are dose dependent, but the commonest is hypertrichosis, which is the fine hairs you get in the, hair, in the face. It also has blood pressure changes, but I've mentioned to you, we use a dose of below five milligrams, and therefore the effects on the blood pressure is very low. It's only about 2%. And it can cause fluid retention and therefore peripheral limb edema. And this again is very low. It's only about 3% of those who take it, particularly because the low dose is low. The side effects are also dose dependent. So every milligram that you increase in the minoxidil, the hypertrichosis increases by about 17%. So by the time you come up to about five milligrams, it seems that about 40 to 50% of patients will have hypertrichosis. The thing is, most of these hairs are fine. They're usually on the hair. They're not that visible. So our patients are actually quite willing to tolerate that. Um, it also seems to increase the terminal hair density of the beard area in men. And that, again, is something many people like because that's what they want. Uh, they want thickening of the hair not only in the scalp but in the, in the beard area as well for men. So as I mentioned, increasing the dosage increases the 
hypertrichosis level. And the biggest series was by Jimenez, and he found a rate of about 55% of hypertrichosis if you reach that level of 5 milligrams. If you have a dose of below 4 milligrams in men and below about 2 milligrams in women, the hypertrichosis seems to be quite minimal. So that's probably the optimal dose that we have to aim for in men and women. As I said, patients are usually not too concerned because these are fine hairs and it is reversible. If you stop the minoxidil, all these vellus hairs uh, seems to fall off. So if we can use the lowest dose of oral minoxidil for hair density, that would be the ideal way of managing the hypertrichosis. You can also use other simple methods of hair removal. You can pluck the hair, you can shave it, you can wax it or use lasers. What are the most serious side effects? The cardiovascular effects are there, but they are very minimal, less than 5%, and usually it's the reduction in blood pressure which seems to be the main factor. There are other features as well, edema, you get increased heart rate because of postural hypertension, you can get palpitations and abnormal ECG, but these are incredibly rare. I mean, I've been using it for a couple of years at least, and I've hardly had any of these side effects, simply because I try and use the lowest dose possible. The time that you get the side effect varies. So the first week or two, you get the immediate side effects, which are cardiovascular, which is tachycardia, which is due to postural hypertension, and you get the lightheadedness as well. All this happens in the first week or so. So I always ask pa patients to take the medication at night so that you're going to lie down after that. And by one or two weeks, your body gets accustomed to it. So you don't get the lightheadedness. There seems to be some cardiovascular effects of uh, recalibrating your system. After that, you get the headaches, and that's because of peripheral vasodilation in the, in the head. And after that, you know, after two or three months, you get the fluid retention and the hypertrichosis. So when you get the side effects is dependent on the chronology of events. The cardiovascular effects are also more likely in those who are older who have more systemic changes. So if they have abnormal renal function or if they have heart problems, they are the ones who have to be started on much lower doses, have a closer watch on their blood pressure because they are more sensitive to these particular side effects. So what can we do to try and reduce the cardiovascular effects? As I mentioned, one of the simple things to do is ask them to take it at night. It's probably best taken after dinner because the bioavailability is increased with food. Um, when you're getting up or sitting up, you ask them to do it slowly, particularly for the first week or two. You try and limit salt intake, and particularly those who are already hypertensive. And for tachycardia, you may need to use other symptomatic measures, maybe uh, beta blockers, and for headache, is it's just paracetamol and NSAIDs. Uh, for the peripheral edema, again, with, you can use other antihypertensives as well if um, the edema, the diuretic seems to be the best ones to use, particularly spironolactone for women. So what are the practical ways of starting this medication? In women, the biggest paper, Rodrigue's Barata paper, said start at 0.5 milligrams and then slowly increase by 0.25 milligrams every three months. In my practice, I tend to start a bit higher. I start at one milligram a day and then go up by 0.5 milligrams till I reach a dose of 2.5 milligrams. That's the maximum dose for women. In men, you start higher. You start at 2.5 milligrams a day and then you increase after every three or four months by half a tablet. So from 2.5, it becomes 3.75, and then you go finally to five milligrams a day. So over a period of about nine months to 12 months, you'd have started at the bottom and gone to the top dose of oral minoxidil. The minimum period of time that you need to treat is at least four to six months. So never give up after two or three months. This hair diameter thickening and increase density all takes time, so you have to take Time and ask our patients to be uh, patient. I always ask them to take images, central parting and side partings in their own phones, and then I ask them to bring it, and if I can see a difference, if they see a difference, then they are more reassured that it is working. The treatment is indefinite, so if, you, if it starts having a beneficial effect, you br basically have to take it for life. This is something new which I read in the papers just quite recently. 
Um, this is the use of sublingual minoxidil. Now, when you take minoxidil orally, there's first pass metabolism. So, not all of it actually reaches the hair follicles in other parts of the body like the scalp. So, Professor Sinclair from Australia has suggested that if you take it sublingually, you bypass this first pass metabolism. So, you get a much higher amount of minoxidil going into the hair follicle and therefore a better response. And he claims that it is much more effective than taking oral minoxidil. And this was the study he did. Uh, it was only a few patients, but you can see that he used incredibly low doses, 0.45 milligrams he started off, and he went all the way up to 4.05 milligrams. Now, the problem is you can't take the oral minoxidil tablets and use it sublingually. It doesn't dissolve, and it doesn't have a good taste either. So, sublingual minoxidil is only available in a few countries. It's not available in the UK. I checked for it. But perhaps when it becomes available, this may be the main way that we use minoxidil to treat hair loss. So, what are the take-home points which we need to know? Um, the first thing is that all the effects on the hair seems to be dose dependent. So as you increase the dose, there seems to be a more beneficial effect. It increases the hair density and the hair diameter. The side effects also seem to be dose dependent. So if you can use the optimal dose where you don't get too much of side effects but have a beneficial effect, that may be the best. We also discussed the hypertrichosis and the cardiovascular side effects. But overall, oral minoxidil seems to be incredibly well tolerated. And it can be used when topicals are difficult, when you know that the compliance isn't great, then changing from topical to systemic is good. And if patients are developing sensitivity, allergic or irritant contact sensitivity, then again, oral minoxidil seems to be good. The dose, as I mentioned, 0.5 to 2.5 in women and 1.25 up to 5 milligrams in men. So remember the five C's of what oral minoxidil is. This came in one of the articles which I read. It's convenience, cosmesis, comfort, cost, and compliance. So these are the five C's which mix oral minoxidil possibly a bit superior to topical minoxidil. So I hope I've given you some information that's helpful. I've changed my practice incredibly in the last two years because of this medication, and I hope it will do the same for you too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Dr. For Paul. Uh, sorry to interrupt uh, Dr. Murtaza. We have a special um, guest, Professor Patrick Yesudain. He is online with us right now to share his invaluable pearls of wisdom with us on the topic. Over to you, Professor. We welcome Dr. Professor. He's a... Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Greetings from Chennai in India. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all this morning, although not in person, but uh, via the Zoom. Usually, when a person is nearing the ninth decade of life, they are considered to be over the hill, and uh, they are forgotten, ignored. So I'm doubly grateful to all of you for remembering me on this morning and inviting me to participate in your conference. You made my day. Now, coming to treatment, I started treatment in uh, practice in the 1960s, and uh, very few drugs were available. Even griseofolvin uh, was not freely available. I remember treating Tinea Capitis in Government General Hospital with topical Whitfield's ointment for, because of non availability of griseofolvin. And when it comes to hair fall, uh, we were treating patients. Purely on empirical basis, iron, the complex, some mild stimulant, my chief's favorite used to be lactic acid, and that's about all. But today, we treat hair fall on a very scientific basis. And coming to minoxidil, as you know, I, I, I consider it to be the most popular drug on this planet. Not only doctors, but practically all lay people know about minoxidil. Uh, thanks to Dr. Google, and uh, everybody starts telling us what to do with minoxidil. So I was fully able to listen to the latter part of Dr. Kivaka's talk. So this oral thing is really a good finding, and as you all know, it was a drug which was uh, uh, serendipitously found out in the treatment of AGA. But for that matter, most drugs are uh, 
serendipitous discoveries when, which we use. And uh, uh, just like penicillin discovered by Sir Flavie. And with this NOVA-like explosion of basic sciences, knowledge, the future looks very bright for the younger dermatologists here. So I, as I said, I am, I am nearing my ninth decade. I can't add much more modern advances, but I think Dr. Divakar has brought out most of the recent advances in minoxidil tablets. And uh, I hope uh, this talk was useful for all of you. But as I said, I've stopped my practice. I only do online consultations. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me to join this. It makes me feel younger, much younger than my uh, 80 odd years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick, Professor Patrick, for coming here and online and uh, talking to us. And I also thank Dr. Paul Divakar for an excellent and enlightening talk. And if time permits, we can take two, three questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. And uh, it is very great to meet the teacher's teacher on Zoom. Thank you, sir. My question to you, Dr. Paul. Uh, hair loss is a dreaded and dramatic complication of chemotherapy. Uh, you rightly mentioned the role of minoxidil in this situation. My question is, can it be used uh, prophylactically along with the starting of uh, chemotherapy or should we wait for the chemotherapy to be finished, the hair loss to occur and then start? And is there a uh, dosage difference in, um, in this situation? The second question is, uh, you mentioned uh, minoxidil doesn't taste very well, agreed, but is it an option that topical minoxidil available with us, can it be used sublingually if one can tolerate the bad taste? Thank you. Thank you. Um, very, very good questions. Um, with, the, with regards to its use in, in cancer, there are case reports still now, and all of them were used after treatment. So after the commencement of the uh, cancer-induced chemotherapy. But I agree, your point is very good. Just like every other medication, every other condition, maybe we could use it prophylactically to thicken the hair and then maintain it after the chemotherapy is con after the chemotherapy has stopped. So maybe that's something which we can think of in the future. But at present, all the case reports are the use of uh, minoxidil after the alopecia is already set in following chemotherapy and the dose is the same up to 2.5 milligrams for women and up to 5 milligrams for men. Uh, in fact most of the case reports were actually in women. With regards to the second question, can we use topical minoxidil sublingually? I doubt if it will reach the concentration because um, it's only 5% minoxidil solution. Um, I think we probably need the full whack of the minoxidil to go in sublingually for it to work. So I don't think there are any reports that I've read about subling of topical minoxidil being sub used sublingually. I think what the pharma have to do is bring out something new which can be used sublingually, which I'm sure will happen in the next few years. Hello, uh, Professor Patrick. It's an honor, sir. Dr. Srikma here. So we have a lot of your students here. UAE is blessed you have created a whole generation of young dermatologists. We are all young. We are only in our <laughs> 60s. <laughs> but uh, you are a legend. And in fact, uh, it's a big honor that you and uh, your son were able to uh, come and uh, talk to us. Regarding Divakar's presentation, crystal clear. It was excellent. And uh, we know that uh, 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 he's an excellent speaker. So Divakar, we hear a lot of uh, uh, off-label stuff when you talk about minoxidil. And uh, we know that uh, topical minoxidil in higher strengths, I, I have come across uh, so many uh, colloquial blends which contain maybe 13%, 15%, 17% minoxidil, which have been used off-label. This is one of those drugs which is popularized by Dr. Google, as our professor said. So even topical minoxidil in higher strengths seem to have side effects. 
more than the so called standard 5% you do get syncope you do get headache you do get arrhythmias and uh, it is uh, walking a tightrope that is uh, the dose as it increases produces effects and produces more side effects and uh, the second issue is that uh, with the so many explosion of new medications for example alopecia jack in inhibitors and so many things minoxidil is being used as an adjuvant for treatment with the, in many of these agents so we need more data and we need more knowledge about drug interactions of uh, minoxidil because uh, we seem to be adding it almost like a vitamin with many other uh, medications so uh, what do you feel uh, will be the future yeah i think you're absolutely right sri kumar there seems to be an explosion of using minoxidil almost for every condition and with regards to the topical agent you are right i think as you increase the concentration there probably is a higher chance of side effects probably because it is systemically absorbed so rather than use a really high strength of topical minoxidil which is not been proven to be effective it may actually be better to give a lower dose of oral minoxidil um, but i don't think there are good studies yet there's only one study which compares 5% topical minoxidil with uh, 1.25 mg of oral minoxidil and they said it's more or less the same but absolutely right unless we have more data more rcts it will be very hard to know what the ideal dose is uh, uh good morning my name is dr sarvat right at the back <laughs> i hope you can see me uh, i just wanted to know while uh, selecting a patient to be put on oral minoxidil what other factors will be should be kept in mind i mean for example if a patient is diabetic or normotensive or hypertensive does the dose differ uh, what uh, what other factors should be kept in mind and uh, what about age restrictions yes again a very good question i usually start off with the conventional drugs first so for example if it's a person it depends on the condition you're treating so let's just take for example female pattern hair thinning i would normally do the first things like look for underlying medical issues low iron low thyroid try and treat that first then look at topical minoxidil and only after i've exhausted the simpler aspects of medical treatment will i move on to oral minoxidil and that's particularly if the person is uh, losing hair and not satisfied with the response so i do use minoxidil but it's more towards the middle to end of my treatment rather than initiating treatment i still think that other other modalities are important it's only when they fail do we add in the oral minoxidil does the dose differ if the patient is already hypertensive or he is normotensive so i don't make that difference actually because uh, whether they are normotensive or hypertensive your body's uh, cardiovascular system seems to adapt to that within a couple of weeks so if if they are hypertensive it is going to be doubly if doubly helpful yeah. but if they are normal normotensive as well their body adjusts to that particular dose within a few weeks okay. thanks yeah dr divakar i want to ask you yeah oh sorry uh mm. do we need to do any investigation or follow up investigation uh generally i don't do any investigations for younger patients but for older patients particularly if they have renal dysfunction or cardiovascular dysfunctions it's probably best we do your urea and electrolytes and the, your renal function tests but ad, ad, apart from that for the really young people i don't do routine blood investigations for oral minoxidil we don't need any monitorization no no there are no Thank guidelines you. for it yet but generally speaking for a fit young person it's unlikely to be useful thank you doctor <laughs>